Um, yeah. Good evening, everyone. And um, I, I, I would say good day if you're not like joining from Nigeria, wherever you're joining from. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here, really. And I can see our wonderful panelists. You know, I was I was trying to read through the um, the bio of our panelists, and I was I was wowed. I was like, wow, who is this Mary? Right, this is the first time I'm meeting her, and her profile is like shocking me. <laughs> then you know, I just went through Catherine's bio, and I was like, wow, again. And you know, the last person here, Olusha Gwadini, I have this soft spot for designers, right? And obviously, you know why. Because um, as a product manager, one of the areas that really appeals to me more is UI. And it's so funny that the reason why this happens to me a lot is that I'm one of the, I think I'm one of the product managers that do believe that um, UX stems from UI. That's just that's just my philosophy. I, I strongly believe in it. So if you are so effective in UX design, and you are, you are kind of poor at UI design. What I try to do is that I try to see a way to assist, probably by bringing in someone that does compliment you, or by ensuring that as my own product designer, that you get to you know up your game in that area. So, well, this is just me and product designers. So, yeah, welcome to the call, everyone, again. And um, you know, I would try to just you know skip all the ceremonies and go straight to the point so i'm going to be starting with a very fantastic question but for one reason or the other i'm, I'm so biased in this and I, I would like to to you know i would like to have mary start with it so mary because you're a quality assurance and software test, testing engineer i want to hear your point i want to see what you would say right concerning this particular question so i know of course, we all have like different perspective about what your role, right, in the tech space is, all right. But however, um, I want to act as though I do not know anything about it, right? Just like probably some people on this call do not know something about it and all of that. So, who in specific is a software testing engineer or a quality assurance, like a software quality assurance um, um, engineer in that sense? Who is that kind of person? Like, what do they do? If I was to to meet you randomly somewhere, um, how will you describe yourself to me, so I can understand? Did you get uh, my question? Yeah, I actually I got that clearly. So, how will you describe? Okay, to the developers, I think I'm a pain. Like, I'm a lot of pain to them. Then to the UI UX people, they're like, oh, okay, she just had to check my design. Then to the project managers, I think I'm more of that is I'm more of like who they will run after. So, but generally, when we talk about QA quality assurance, we're talking about ensuring that the particular product shot you're working with that is being delivered to the to the society or to your target audience actually makes specification and actually makes standard so a lot of people say okay qa it does it totally have um affect the tech space qa cuts across different industries you will see qa's in manufacturing you will see qa so it's not just um software alone so you can attest to fact that quality assurance is needed everywhere you need to ensure that the products that you're delivering actually meets specification and actually meets the standard and actually meets industry specification. You don't want to deliver a project or a product that nobody is going to use. So as much as we try to find for it, find bugs, we also try to ensure that the processes that are that is taking, that is the processes that we're taking actually meets um, industry standard. You don't want to break laws and and other things. And you also don't want to make a project that a product that is actually very difficult for others to understand and for others to make use of. So when we talk about quality assurance, it's not just the testing. I know a lot of people have this idea of okay, quality assurance. Is it not just the test? Developers can actually do the testing. But no, we're not just talking about testing. We're actually saying there's something that you are not just seeing that a QA would see. There's something that the developer might not see just because of, oh, they have a, a target to meet or a deadline to meet. There's something they might not see that we can say, oh, why don't you do it this way? I think the industry is moving. So this is the current trend. 
and let's just go with this trend or there's an easier way or a better way to work. So that's what QA is all about. All right, thank you very much, um, uh, Mary, for that wonderful point. Um, if I get you correctly, so you are saying that a QA is not just what everybody is familiar with. Uh, I mean, for those who are familiar with who a QA is, so QA is now like has, has now gone beyond, you know, that kind of kind of identity where people just see them as oh, they just test software and see the way it works and see and to ensure that it works properly. So now QA now like delve into other areas. Of practice and niches, right? Where yeah. people don't pay attention to. That, that's a very wonderful point. And I mean, um, I'm sure um everyone here would have like gotten one or two things right about that. So I will quickly move to Olushegun. I intend to keep catering as the last person I will ask this question for one reason or the other, uh, which you all will like kind of know, right? When I ask. So I'm going to be asking you this, Olushegun. Um, who is a product designer? But now I would like to be specific in this way, right? Um, talk about what you do as a product designer, but you know, I want you to talk about these two dimensions, UI and UX designer. Um, Olusheg, let's have it. All right. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Olasen. Um, apologies, I won't be able to start like, turning my video. I'm trying to manage uh, the bandwidth of my network, right? Um, okay, so um, to who a product designer is, and um, also how it relates to um, UI and UX. Let me first of all start by defining what a product design is. Right? What is product design, right? Uh, we can break that into two, right? We can um, break it into products, and we can bring it into design, right? So when we talk about a product, we're talking about a tool, right, that enables people to, you know, carry out activities, probably to, you know, solve problems, right? And when we're talking about design, Right, you're talking about the art of creating, right? The process of creating. So when you put those two together, right, product design basically means the art of creating tools, right, to solve problems, right? Basically. And therefore, a product designer, right, is someone who um plays a crucial role, right, in the product development life cycle, right, by transforming um ideas into tangible products that basically meet user needs, align with business goals, and help the product stand out in the market, right? So, I mean, in summary, right, is basically you just um, creating the experience, the total product experience, right, for uh, for businesses, right, that enables users to be able to solve problems. Now, when we talk about it in terms of UI and in terms of UX, in terms of user interface and in terms of um, user experience, right, we all know today that if you want to interact with the product, right, you have to interact with an interface, right, and that's pretty much what the UI is, right. UI is that um, physical aspect of the product, right, that you interact with, right, basically. And user experience is the feedback you get, right, <clears throat> from interacting with these interfaces. Now, um, concerning, um, you know, UI and UX, right, which, which one is more important, which one is normal, which one is less important, right? Um, let me state, <clears throat> let me state for the fact that both of them are kind of like in a constant loop, okay? And uh, what determines your UI is your UX. And basically, um, the UX also is like an effect of the UI. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you understand? So as a product designer, you need to be able to kind of like find a balance between these two things, right? Between these two. Um, understanding your users, right? Carrying out researches and um, trying to um, understand their pain points, understand their preferences, conceptualizing, right? Um, you know, all these falls under the UX side of things, right? Why are you going into designing, right? Enabling consistency, enabling the accessibility, right? Um, to be and enabling the uh, product to be much more usable, right? Falls on the UI side, right? So basically, the UI and the UX falls in a constant loop, right? That all defines the product experience. So in summary, let me just say, um, let me try to you know um, cap every single thing up by saying the product designer, right? Ensures that the products are intuitive. Right, it's easy to use and enjoyable for the intended, um, intended audience. Basically, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for that, Olusegun. And I will move straight up to Catherine. So for you, Catherine, it's so wonderful that you know some years back we probably did not really have a profession like yours, but thanks to yeah. innovation, you know, um, evolution in that sense, right? That that give it to your profession because trust me 
I've worked in a situation where we don't have UX writers. It's, it's literally the product manager doing the UX writing, right? Or someone else in the team. And I've also worked in a situation where I had like a wonderful UX writer and I was blown away, right? By how easy and fantastic yeah. my job was because I didn't have to think about things that, you know, um, a whole, that needed a whole brain and a whole human, right? To get done in that sense. So, um, I mean, if there are like one or two persons that appreciate the job of a UX writer a lot, I'm part of those persons. I've also worked with a product designer that is so particular about UX writing in such a way that if you're working with her, if even if you're a UX writer in the team and you're not so solid, you're in trouble because she will criticize every line, every word, every placement of those words and all of those things, right? So I would like to know, for the sake of the audience, right, who is a UX writer? And why do we need to have a UX writer when we already have a UX designer? In that sense, if you can clarify that for the audience. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the kind words. I think I'll just start from the basics, which is communication. Um, communication is basically a fundamental aspect of our lives as humans, as humans that are interacting right now, we are communicating, right? And so every human relies on some basic forms of communication, such as spoken words, written words, facial expressions, name it to be able to interact, right? So UX writers are the professionals responsible for crafting the user guiding messages that makes human computer interaction possible, right? So in our world today, beyond just interacting with uh, Mary here or you or last saying day, we are now interacting with systems and products and computers, right? And we need some form of communication to allow that interaction to be possible. And one of the most common ways is written words, right? So UX writers are the professionals that are responsible for that niched aspect of product design to ensure that the words are understandable and they communicate to our users and helps them move from point A to B. Then to your other question, it's quite simple. Uh, a product designer focuses on that visual aspect. And then we focus on the nuance of language, right? So that's it. Awesome, awesome. The key takeaway here is that um, a product designer focuses on the, you know, the, the visual aspect. Um, I remember Richard was saying something like, um, you know, UX has to do with the, uh, you know, in my own paraphrased word now, the impact of the design on the user, how they feel about it when they're, you know, interacting with it. But here you are saying, oh, no, it is actually about the communication aspect, right? That is what yeah. you know, the job actually gets or to, gets to take away, you know, for the users. Uh -huh. um, this uh -huh. is very, 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 very fantastic because, you know, we are going to a direction here. And for the audience, can you see how that we have each of these jobs looking like a different moving parts However, in the real sense, they have a way they sort of align, you know, to, to, to get us to a destination, right, in the tech space. Some of the other roles that have been talked about in the previous panel session, if you were there, you would have also been able to, like, connect one or two dots, right? So um, I'm going to say it this way, you know, for the purpose of synchronizing everything that the three um, speakers have said, the, the three panelists, I would say that just look at this as a situation where you have... If you are so familiar with a place like a restaurant, all right, in a restaurant, you will not just have the food jumped to your table. You need the food, but you have like someone in the kitchen that is trying to get the food done. Now, I'm not using, um, if, I, I just remember now that this illustration is going to look like something else, right, in the text space, but it's not, right, uh, for those who are familiar with APIs. So I'm not trying to talk about API A. I'm trying to talk about a situation where you just have a team working together to achieve one common goal. So imagine a restaurant where someone takes the other, um, you know, someone prepares it and someone gets it, you know, gets it over to you. It's a teamwork at the end of the day. Um, the final answer is like 
as a result of the input of one or two persons, all right? So um, that is just like the summary of what this looks like in the real sense or in reality, all right? And, and that will take me to the next question very quickly, all right? So there are actually so many skills that are required to do things in each of these roles that we've mentioned. But now I want to flip it over. So I will start with Catherine, all right? So Catherine, over to you. What are the skills, essential skills that you that, that you deem fit based on your experience that are required to be successful in your role? I have so many things coming up my head now. So <laughs> I would wait, you know, to mention them. If you don't mention them, I will sanction you. <laughs> All right. I feel like you read my mind by mentioning that word essentials, because that's typically what I call it in my mentorship programs, like the top essentials, because there are so many things that you might most likely need, obviously, but then just in order of priority, the essentials that you need to, you know, excel in UX writing First and foremost, obviously, you need to have like a top tier content aptitude. You need to understand English, basically. You need to understand language and how to communicate using language. So you need to be able to write clearly, concisely, and in a way that is user-friendly. Uh, another thing is research. You need to know how to conduct research. You need to know how to investigate, collect and organize and even analyze data for, yeah, basic research. So if you're that kind of a person that knows how to dig deep on online, yeah, you need to know how to research. Um, I think soft skills are also very important because a UX writer's role is very collaborative. Geez, you work at the intersection of so many teams you need to know how to have soft skills like collaboration. You would work with designers, work with annoying product managers and um, you know different kind of people. And you also need to be adaptable. Unlike other forms of writing, you can just write a blog article, for instance, and then you, you get a pass to publish it. But for UX writing, you would have to present your copy to stakeholders. You see a PM coming in to comment on Figma, giving you very, very minute feedback about your copy. You need to be able to be adaptable. So all of that is still under soft skills. You need to be empathetic. You need to know how to understand people's pain points. You need to understand what their needs are. And that empathy also spreads across your team members as well. It's not just being uh, empathic towards users. You need to know how to build great relationship with your teams, your stakeholders. You need to know how to push back, but in a very respectful way. So that's all part of soft skills. I think the last skill is a growth mindset. You need to always be on the look because you're in a technologically inclined space. Um, things are changing. There is AI. There's so many things happening all at once. You need to know how to spread your tentacles, not too far. I call that being a T-shaped person. So you need to know how to still be grounded in your specialty, but then be broad, be generalistic, just enough to know what is latest in you are ux design what's the latest in product management what's the latest in ai so that when you are in a meeting or you're speaking with people you know how to communicate and you know they know the kind of value that you bring to the table i think off the top of my head those are like essentials that you really need to um to have to get started okay let me twist it this way if I was to start my journey today, which one will you tell me to start with? Like, which one do you think? <laughs> if you just want to start today, you must start this way, like in terms of the essentials. Yes, top tier content aptitude. I think that's the one because you need to, the others, 
might let's say for instance you're starting your career as a freelance ux writer you may not even have a team to collaborate with so you may not have that strong collaboration skills uh, really grown yet you can get away with that for now but what will get you um to pass that doorway into the industry is that top tier attitude towards content and also understanding the basic principles of, you know, UX design, heuristics and all those things. So, yeah. Hello, hola, Celia, ahí de. Fivo, can you hear me now? Yes, I, I am. am. Sorry, okay. I, I mistakenly over like on my mouse and it locked my screen. So I had to quickly unlock my screen. All right. Okay. So yeah. So um, you know, I'll take this question. I will skip Olushegun for a reason. I'm coming back to a very, very, very sensitive question for Olushegun. So I moved to Mary, right? Mary, can you walk us through what a typical day in your office, you know, the office of, um, you know, the, 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 the most wonderful and excellent um, role in that sense, right? That, that the role that challenges almost everybody in the team, you know, if you are doing what you are not supposed to be doing, this is a role that kind of, kind of calls you back and say, hey, we can't go, to, we can't go to production like this, go back, you know? So can you tell us what a typical day in your room looks like? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, what is like a typical day in your room? What do you do on daily basis, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, so I won't say my my what I currently do is typical, but I'll just give you like an oversight of how my day goes. So we wake up in the morning, then we do the old normal day-to-day -day chores. Then to get started on, with work, um, I join a stand-up every morning by 10 a.m. So in the stand-up, I think for those that are non-tech or for those, I'm sure some other persons have, have like a brief understanding of what stand-up is. It's just like a 15-minute chat of what you've done um what is what is what you have not yet done and what you hope to do and if you have any blockers so that's like 15 minutes so th this is when we pick up tax for the new day like we pick up some tax that the developer has moved so because we're using an agile framework we do things like we have like a sprint of two weeks so we pick up the tax so the developer has moved it to dawn so we assign tax for that day then we pick it up so in testing, um, there must have been requirements and um, written down requirements for um, for the products, like for the particular feature that I'm testing. So there's a requirement down. So pick it up, we test it. Um, before now, you should already have your test cases or scenarios of what you want to test. And the test cases, you are covering both positive and negative. So when we mean positive, for example, when you are testing onboarding, a positive scenario will be, I should be able to log in or sign up. A negative scenario will be, can I log in with wrong password? Can I log in with another email and another password? Um, that kind of, that type of scenario. So that's what we do on a daily basis. Then I test it. If there is any feedback, I create a bulk ticket. I write out write down the steps to re and reproduce this bug and also drop a screen record or a video. Now you need to drop evidence in our own typical ninja. You gotta explain tire and no evidence. So you don't want to explain tire and there's no evidence. So you need to show evidence. And reason being that it's possible that the developer might fix something and would override that bug. And when the developer picks up that particular bug, I'm like, ah, this, I cannot replicate it or something. So you need to show the developer, okay, these are the steps on how to reproduce it. And there are different tools out there on how to do that. 
So that helps you to do that. So after doing that, um, sometimes you get on a call for those that are unable to replicate it, or you get on a call with the developer when he says it works on my local and it doesn't work. So those kind of fights that it works on my local, I think it's a well no fight. It works on your local. I really don't care. I want to see it work on my own system. So that's what we do. We test, we give feedback, then we do the summary at the end of the day. So it depends on the number of projects you're working on for me. So you could be on different projects. So you have to do the same standard for different projects, essentially. So that's how it goes. For me, then for others who are doing automation testing, they might have to write codes and run that test scripts and stuff like that. So typically that's how the day go. It looks simple, but you can spend a lot of time testing a particular thing because you're trying to cover different scenarios. So when we say testing, we're not saying pick up. Now I said login. Now a lot of people are saying, eh, she is just login. No, it's just not login. No, we do different tests. So that's how my day goes. All right, fantastic. Um, you know, <laughs> I was laughing when you said that um, it, it works on my locale and it doesn't work, you know, everywhere else. So wh why is it working? So actually, that's like a very, very funny a situation. But, you know, it is well, that's like one of one of the reasons why, you know, we go through trainings. All right. So that I mean, for, for those who are on this call, I, I think I would say you are so lucky because um I can trust Trevor to do justice to whatever professional leap you want to take. I'm I'm a living proof, all right. So but let's just get back to the class for now. So don't worry, uh, it's not on your look at too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny that sometimes you'll be with the developers and you know, right on that call, they can see that it's not working, then they fix it immediately. Then they, you know, they, they have this way and they just, before you know what's up, oh, it's working. And you'll be like, but this was not working like some minutes ago. Well, don't worry, you're going to be fine. I understand. Okay, so let me go to Olushegun. Olushegun, the question I have for you is similar to Catherine's question, but it's a little bit different, all right? So um, it's also to talk about the essential skills. However, I want to die, you know, I want to digress a bit. So the question I'm going to ask you is not really about the essential skills alone. It's more of do you need a technical skill to become a pro product designer? All right. And if so, what are those skills? Number one. Then the second question for you is um, what are the major basic, like what are the basic tools that you that you use, you know, on daily basis as a product designer? And how difficult are they to, to learn? Let me put it that way. So over to you, Shemi. Um, all right. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much for that question. Um, do you need technical skills, any technical skills, right, to be a product um, designer? Well, let me say on its own, right, there are certain technical prof proficiency that um, a product designer is supposed to have, right? And um, um, I'm not sure if the technical skills they are talking about has to uh, be in terms of coding, right? If, if it's in terms of coding, if it's in terms of coding, right? Coding is not necessary for you to be a product designer, right? It is a skill that can help you to be valuable, okay, to your company, um, basically, and also help you to be valuable to, your, to yourself, right, in understanding how um, developers can, you know, implement your designs and also helps you to collaborate, um, you know, better with your developers, but it's not something that is necessary, right? Um, but on the other side, right, uh, the technical proficiency that you need, right, to be a product designer, um, these are skills that include, like, wireframing and prototyping, right? Um, the ability for you to be able to conduct research and also know when to use, um, you know, certain types of research. Right, you want to know when to use the user interview, you want to know when to carry out the survey, um, you want to also know when, um, you know, to carry out the focus group, basically. So, um, these are kind of like few um, technical proficiencies that you kind of like need, right, to be um, a product designer, um, basically. Also, the ability to create information architecture and, um, you know, building your knowledge on um, visual designs, right? For example, like you need to understand. How typography works. You need to understand how color theory works, 
right? You also need to understand, um, you know, the concept of layout, right? These are technical parts um, of product design that we kind of like go a long way in you building great product experiences, right? And um, uh, can you remind me of the second question again? Last um, The tools, right? Yeah, yeah, the tools, the, the tools. Yes. All right, so um, basically for the tools, right, that you need to be a product designer, so, like I said, right, when I was talking about the technical proficiency, wireframing, prototyping, conducting research, you know, creating information activity, there are certain tools, right, that helps you to kind of like um, do um, all these um, activities, basically. For designing, right, everyone on this call probably have heard of Figma, right? So, Figma is a design and prototyping tool, right, that um, enables you um, not just to cater for the visual aspects, of your design, but also take to cater for the interaction, uh, for the interactive aspects, right? So it helps you to wireframe, it also helps you to prototype, right? There are brainstorming tools out there too, right? Um, like FigJam, like Miro, right? All these are depending on whatever is much more convenient for your team, right, um, to use, right? Uh, when you're wireframing also, um, I know there's a tool called Whimsical, right, that you can use to wireframe and, um, when you're conducting your user testing, right, um, there are certain tools that you can use um, for user testing. Um, there's Maze out there. Maze is a pretty good tool, right, for you to be able to kind of like carry out testing on your designs, right? And um, um, also on the um, other aspects of, um, you know, knowing um, typography and um, your color theory, right, Figma can take care of that. Um, there was a time when we had it to call Invision, but currently Invision is no longer in the market. Uh, apart from Figma, Sketch 2 is another tool, right, that also enables you to be able to do this. And on the level of, um, you know, difficulty of these tools, let me be frank with you, none of those tools are very difficult, right? It just takes, um, you know, the intentionality for you to learn them, right? We know that we are in the, tech, in the technology space and innovation is something that kicks in almost every, every, every blessed day, right? So tools are being upgraded, um, tools are evolving, right? It just takes a level of intentionality for you to learn how do you want to, you know, keep yourself updated, you know, why, right? Keep yourself abreast of, you know, the constant innovation that these tools are, you know, are, you know making. I, I know there was a time before when Figma didn't have the developer tool, but today, right now, they have... Um, the developer to right, and um, you know, it just needs to just uh, find a way to keep learning. Um, you know um, how to uh, you know keep keep up with the innovations of this tool. Awesome, awesome. Um, thanks for those wonderful points, Olusegun. I'm still with you, Olusegun. So just stick with right. me for some. Minutes. So I want to ask this particular question, all right? But I want to give you a tip. So. Um, this is very common in the product management space where um, when you are being asked as a product manager, what does success mean in your profession? You know, um, a lot of us, we get to say, hey, revenue, revenue, revenue. The product must be making money. Users must love the product and on and on like that. So here is my question because I've also, you know, I've, I've heard and I've seen and I know that these days, even product designer, product designers sort of, have to have, um, I would say, a sort of um, success metrics, KPI in that sense, that is tied to revenue in one way or the other, you know, in, in, in some of these companies we have recently. So my question is, do, do you agree with that, number one? Like, do you, do you agree that, um, you know, revenue should be part of the success metrics, right, of a product designer? Number one. Then the second question will now be: What are the other success? What are the other success metrics that you that you feel right right makes a fulfilled product designer in that sense a successful product designer? Did you get my question? Um, right. If I get you correctly, right, um, you're asking uh, what um, key role does product design has to play, right, in um, key business success metrics like um, revenue, right? Right. Um, okay. Um, that is a, that, that's kind of like a tricky question. And um, this is because um, indirectly, right, product design can actually contribute to um, the revenue that the company makes. Okay. Um, 
So let me first. So let me answer that question by stating um, certain um, metrics that UX, that product design, right, can contribute to, right, and um, you know, that and that can kind of like indirectly, you know, contribute to um, the revenue aspects, right, of a business. <clears throat> I think the first thing that we first will see uh, is the customer satisfaction and loyalty, right. When I was defining, um, you know, what a product designer do, right? We, um, a product designer is someone that creates the product experience, right, for um, users, right, and also to to be able to kind of like achieve business objectives, right? So look at it in this way: if you create a product that has great experience for users, that is usable for users, right, and is useful for the users, right, there's a sense of loyalty and a sense of satisfaction that comes with this, right, that enable the users to kind of like stick to your product, okay? And one thing that I've, um, you know, sort of got to understand over the years is the fact that people are ready to pay for quality, okay? People are ready to pay for quality, right? And so therefore, if you raise the bar of, your, of the experience of your product, right, and people can see the value in it, right, they will be ready to, you know, churn out their money to buy your product, okay? As you know, as I well, relatively right to some designers, as I as Adobe Illustrator is right, uh, when it comes to like subscription, multi subscription, right? Designers are constantly paying for that product, right? And it's because they see the value in it, and because the experience that they're getting from it is quite good. Trust me, there are other products in the market that are free, right? But they are not able to kind of like give the experience that Adobe Illustrator is giving. Do you understand, right? People can actually still, um, you know. Um, sort of still argue with us that there are several other means, but I can tell you for a fact that the product experience is one of the reasons why people still stick to it. And so, therefore, if the experience of a product is kind of like top notch, right, the customer satisfaction is going to be and the customer loyalty is going to be high. Okay. One of the aspects also for product design is enabling people to, is enabling business, right, to be able to kind of like achieve their business objectives, right. And one of the ways that I can help to do this, right, is by keeping customers engaged right with the product experience and this basically leads to retention and churn re reduction right imagine if you you know uh, want to use a product and the onboarding um the onboarding flow or the onboarding pro process of that product is quite stressful or you know it's taking um you know a long time right i'm pretty sure the churn rate right for that product is going to be very very high people are going to be dropping off Right. So as a product designer, you want to also create a very good product experience, right, for um, uh, for those kind of processes, for those kind of flow, right, that will enable the churn, um, you know, for, the, for there to be like a churn reduction and thereby, you know, um, increasing the revenue that, you know, a product, um, you know, is giving out. Also, when you look at the conversion, when, when you look at conversion rates, right, and I um, know that we talk about this in terms of websites, also sometimes in terms of web applications, right, Product design basically directly um, affects right, the conversion rates, right? If you don't carry out, if you don't carry out an optimized user journey, right, and this falls on the aspect of the UX, right? If you don't carry out a big study, a great study on optimizing the user journey, right, and moving barriers to conversion, right, people are going to drop off, okay? And um, this leads to you, you know, constantly. Um, um, so what's so what's going on? Um, constantly, um, you know, investing in a lot of UX writing and having proper architecture, right, for you to be able to kind of like achieve this. So I can say that, um, you know, to an extent, right, product design can actually help to increase, um, you know, the revenue that the company um, gets basically from the user. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I will move right straight to Catherine. Catherine, please help me. Is it Catherine or Catherine? Catherine. Catherine, okay. Um, apologies. All right. So there's a question for you, Catherine. Um, yeah, you, you you know, you work in a space where people just like I, I came from a background, you know, of course, construction. There is this rule called quantity surveying, right? That's like what I studied in school. And I remember very well that anytime I want to talk to people and I'm like, hey, I'm a quantity surveyor, you say, oh, okay, so can you survey my land for me? <laughs> you know, 
Um, I'm looking at your role and I'm looking at a UX design role and I'm seeing some similarities, right? For people who don't really pay attention to details. When they just say, oh, is a is the UX, whatever it is that you have after that UX, they don't care. The point is, oh, he's, he's doing UX. Oh, that's a UX designer. So you're not a UX designer, you're a UX writer. All right. So I would say it is very, very possible, right, that there will be so many controversies, all right, about your role or in your practices or whatever it is. So the question I would ask is, what are the controversies you've had about your role, right, as a UX writer since you started UX writing? Are there controversies at all? And how did you handle them, you know? Um, Five minutes, mm -hmm. minutes, probably you can take it take it away from. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think I'll just start with the most obvious that you've mentioned, even though we've had other controversies. So in terms of uh the act of confusing our roles with that of the designer, I just like to say uh, UX, UX writing and UX design are like subsects of user experience. We have one goal to make the experience of the product seamless through impactful design and impactful language, as I've shared earlier, but they aren't the same thing. For me, I like to think of them as cousins instead of siblings. Just think of that cousin you have that, you know, is somehow linked to you, but then isn't your direct siblings, yeah? They both solve user problems, but they use different approaches, basically. So we as UX writers, like I said, we focus on the language and creating a conversation or like a dialogue between the product or the system and the user. So think of content strategy, think of written words, brand tone and voice, et cetera. But in contracts, uh, product designers, the you know, it's more like they create a space for this conversation we write to happen. So think of interface design, visual hierarchy, typography, colors, and the amazing things they do as designers. They're not the same thing. So yeah. And I think another common misconception is that people just assume that UX writing is just writing. So people, that's why I think a lot of persons try to do the writing themselves. And at the end of the day, you can tell even in the, um, even in the Nigerian market, let me not go too far. We have amazing products like Piggy Vest, for instance, that have awesome UX writing and the entire experience is humanized. You feel welcomed. And then think of our normal traditional bank apps with very horrible UX writing and how that can be a pain in the ass, right? So people, there's this misconception that it's just writing, but it's honestly, it's not. We do a lot of research, a lot of content strategy. We even do technical things like information architecture, right? Some of us are that nuanced and specialized. We understand information architecture, information hierarchy, and define all of that. Our counterparts, designers, they create wireframes, which is like low fidelity representation of their design ideas. We, on the other hand, we create content frames, which is more like a, a way to show you the big idea of what we're trying to communicate. So it's not just carrying words and just slamming words on the screen. That's like a major, major misconception. And I think that's why we always find ourselves in this situation where we have to keep advocating for our, our profession. And it gets tiring sometimes because we try to, you know, advocate and convince people it's, it's beyond that. And I think that also affects, I think it affects some designers in a way because we aren't really working um, exact, we aren't really exactly working on the business side of things. So it's quite difficult to actually, you know, determine, determine conversions, except for companies that run A-B testing and so on. It's very easy to run numbers on marketing roles, copywriting roles, social media roles. But within products, people don't think long-term. They don't think about 
um, you know, retaining users. So that's one of the challenges that we face. And I think uh, what else again, controversy. I think another controversy, I think that one would just be like a normal thing in the, in the tech industry. There's always these title wars. We have like, I, I feel like we are the shape shifters of the digital world because some persons will call you copywriters today. You could be working with a designer for the rest of your life and he will still refer to you as a copywriter. And then some persons refer to you as a content writer. So it's, it's like that. But I'm sure everyone that has been on this call after hearing the things I've said would know that copywriting, content writing, UX writing aren't the same thing. Yeah, those are the most common controversies. All right. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I got a lot from that. So <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to move over to, to Mary. Um, Mary, uh, I think it's been a while I heard your voice. So I want to confirm if you are still there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I'm still very much here. All right. So what 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 is the best um or I would say what is the worst right so what is the best best or worst working experience you've had all right as a software tester mm -hmm. I know you have been all right but you know for the sake of this session just it was like one maybe one or two right yeah thank you. Okay, so um, my best moment would be um, for me to be to see my project go live and get good feedbacks about the project. So I most people are like, oh, you're calling your project? Yes, I work on it. Come on, so I'll call it my project or my product or any whole whatever you call it. But that that there's this joy when you finally see your product live and everybody is raving about it or they are having good feedback concerning their project products. My worst moment will be to, one of my worst moments is um, working on a product and they never went live. Like it's so heartbreaking because when you think about the time, the energy you spent on that product and you've done everything, maybe due to one issue or the other, they don't go live or they never make money from it and you'll be waiting like you know you want to brag about that oh i work on this product and you know if it doesn't go live you don't have bragging rights and so it's it's um, one of those moments and another was moment to be to work with a team that there's no really um there's no really collaboration like it can be it can be tiring for a qa because most times you want to work with a team where each person understands what's going on. Me, where you see each person in a professional setting as maybe your friend in a professional setting where you could relate to the person and say, okay, this is what I want. This is how I want to, this is the idea I see. And that, that is something that brings you joy. But when there is no collaboration, where everybody, where everybody seems to be working as um as maybe outside of each other before you get to communicate, you need to pass through a very strict channel. Those moments are something that you just don't want to wake up in the morning and work on such products. So that's for me. But for best moments, I'll tell you where my products go live. Like I'm so excited when I see the UI is UI in the 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 process the everybody is just commenting on how flawless the design is on how flawless the onboarding flow is on how flawless it is to use the application or the web the mobile application the web application it's it's something that that excites me that makes me happy like i'm really excited like i'm like oh yeah we we did it so that's for me all right thank you so much for that um in 30 seconds, one minute there about, I want you to touch base on something. So how about a situation where, it, have you ever been in a situation where a product was deployed live, then at, it was at that point that you caught a bug? Have you ever, ever been in that situation before? Right, yeah. if you have, 
So that should also be a worst moment. So yeah. All right. Yeah, but sometimes it's not necessarily a gross moment. It, except, so if it's not a critical bug, then it's something we can always push like a new version to. But for critical bug, I've, I've not had such scenario. Except I've already told the developer, don't go live and they go live. And so that, that cannot be my worst moment because I told you, don't go live and you go ahead. But if it's something that has to do with a minor fix, it just like a small UI fix, then it's it's not critical. It's something that maybe, so when we talk about QA, I, I think it really affects our life because when you want to go to the market to buy something, a QA will QA just the apple. Something is not looking well about the apple. I remember I gave a tailor, like a clue to make, and I was looking at it. She said, you want to find faults. And in my mind, I'm like, it's not that I want to find faults. I've gotten so used to looking out for those tiny details that you would not look for. So that's it. So that that's it for me. So it's, it's just like a way of life. Awesome. 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 I like that. It's a way of life. It's like a way of life. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, Olusegun, back to you. Um, what keeps you going as a product designer? What is that one thing that keeps you going? You know, and we have, um, if you're familiar with, if you're familiar with, I mean, not you, I'm talking to the audience now. If you're familiar with, um, you know, graphic designer, they complain a lot, right, about clients rejecting their design after they spent like nights and, you know, they burnt candle, digital candles in that sense. To come up with creative designs, they've seen it as like the deal breaker that this is like awesome. If this person does not want this thing, then I don't know what this person is going to want anymore. Then they submit it and you hear stuff like, I even I saw someone yesterday and it was like, hey, my wife said the design is not nice. You know <laughs> that you should go back and design it again, whatever, whatever that that means. So, only check in your own case, of course, nobody's wife is going to say your design is not nice. It's probably going to be the team members, the stakeholders, or somebody saying that. So, yeah, for you, um, you know, what keeps you going when things you know go sour in that sense? What 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 are those things that just you know try to hold you, hold you together and get you going? Um. <clears throat> okay. So. One thing for me, right, that keeps me going, that keeps the juice flowing, right, basically, is the constant zest, right, to want to contribute to the growth of, um, you know, the technology and the business, right? Um, I'm always the kind of person that I want to do whatever it takes, right, to make sure I contribute my own quota, right, to this particular task, to this particular product. And um, it's because every single time you see that product, right, go live, every single time you see that, you see people using that product, you can always point to it and say, yeah, there's a part of me there, right? And um, you can always say you gave your best, okay? So irrespective of um, the kind of like, um, should I call them inhibitions or roadblock, right? That's just to always want to contribute to it, right? Always want to con contribute to my own part. Right, it's one of the things that kind of like keep me going, right? And it's one of the things that makes me want to kind of like put in more effort, right? Um, into, in, in, into that, right? The constant, I mean, enthusiasm that stems from realization that um, design decisions that I make, right, has the potential to enhance user experiences. Okay, so that is one of the key, um, you know, uh, factors, right? That kind of like keep me going, for example. Thank you so much, Olusegun. So I will take this question. I will give like I will, I will just send this question out. So either Olusegun, Catherine, or Mary, anyone who is interested can answer, right? Um, but if you're answering, I mean, we I think we are far, um, you know, be, behind time. So we just have to prob probably use like a very short time to answer the question. So the question is, I'm trying to go into tech. All right, um, but I have no prior tech experience at all. I, I do not even know anything about technology. I don't know anything at all, but I want to go into tech, all right? And um, specifically, all right, I'm going into either QA, right, or 
you know, product design or UX writing. I, I, I personally believe that there is a sort of similarity in all of these roles. So maybe one answer can cover for the remaining two um, panelists, right? So, but whoever it is that can test it heavily, um, you know, um, just take it away. So um, who is going to do that? Is it Mary, is it Olishegun, is it Catherine? Anybody? Um, okay, um, I think, can I take that? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think, all right. So um, basically I would say, first of all, there is no substitute for the basics, right? Um, the integrity of whatever you build, right, will depend on how strong your foundations are, right? So there's no substitute for that basics. Don't, don't focus so much on the tools at first, right? Understand the reasons why things are done, understand the way they are done, right? Understand the principles that are involved, right? So the first thing is that there's no substitute for, for the basics, right? Um, second thing is for you to practice a lot. Trust me, the tech space can be interesting, right? And at the same time, it can be frustrating, right? You need to constantly practice for you to constantly improve, right? Um, practice how to carry out efficient, effective research how to carry out effective testing, right? Uh, practice your design skills, right? These are the only ways by which you can get better and you can sharpen your skills, right? Um, another thing I will tell you is that experience will go a long way, okay? And what I mean by this is that connect with experienced um, leaders, experienced seniors, right, in the industry, either through online forums, social media groups, um, you know, your local communities, right? seek mentorship from these professionals, right, who are willing to share their insights. And this is not me asking you to start bombarding uh, people's DMs all about on Twitter and LinkedIn, right? I mean, I mean um, you've practiced, right? You've understood, you've understood the basics, you've practiced, right? Then you can start going to, you know, some of these people and say, hey, I'm a newbie, right? This is what I've been able to do, right? What do you think I can do better? What's the guidance that you can give me as I progress along my journey, right? Um, the other thing is for you to embrace a growth mindset, right? Always be innovative, right? Um, the tech space is, con is constantly evolving, right? And you don't want to be left behind. So um, embrace a growth mindset. Um, what you learned yesterday might be obsolete today, okay? So constantly improve, right? Constantly grow. And um, the last thing, right, is for you to keep learning. Just keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for that, Olivia. I mean, um, if there's anything anybody should take out of these things that Olivia has have said today, I think is the fact that there is no substitute, right, for the basics. Um, I don't know if there's any other professional and um, mentor you know, mentor-driven advice that I think you can get, right, in that sense. Um, I, I really appreciate our speakers, our panelists. I appreciate you so much, Mary. Thank you for joining and thank you for, you know, taking a lot of, a lot of hard questions, right, away for our audiences. And at the same time, thank you, Lushegun. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. This was really a very fantastic session. And I yield my mic and I say favor over to you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to our panelists. Yes, now we are down to the Q&A section. Elia, um, I mentioned that if you have a question, you can drop it on uh, the Slido link that was shared. I'm going to share that link once again, just in case you want to drop your questions. Uh, if you have any questions, as we're into the Q&A section. Um, Thank you very much once again to our moderators and panelists. I'm going to be sharing my screen now so we can see the questions we have and we'll, we'll address them. All right, so um, I have a question here. I believe you can, you can see my screen now. Um, the first question here is I know how to design, but I don't um, know how to advance. Can you guys do a mentorship program that? Uh, mentorship guide to when I'm fully ready for the market. Uh, this is not a mentorship program. Uh, this is uh, an incubator program to help you upskill, an upskilling program. So I'm sorry, we might not be able to help you right now, but uh, you can also check um, platforms like ADP List um, and all the likes for, for some mentorship. Uh, and 
Shebu, if you're looking to take anyone under your mentorship guide, I think this is, uh, you are very much, uh, I don't know if Shebu is looking to take anyone under his mentorship guide. Yeah, so this is not me putting you on the spot, but if you're if you up to it, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Thank you very much for your question. Um, do you guys have internship for beginners? This is not an internship program. This is an upskilling program that will help you upskill in the seven different career paths that we've mentioned, product management, product marketing, product design, content marketing, UX writing, data analytics, quality assurance, and content marketing. I think I've said that, yeah. So um, please, what are the requirements to start the program? And is it possible for someone to do two programs? All right, you cannot do two programs. You can only apply to one program and see that program through. Uh, the tools required, um, First of all, your how I put it, your will to learn, and yes, your digital devices. Depending on the career path you're going for, some of them will require you. You have a laptop. Things like design, um, data analytics will require that you have your laptop. Product design and data analytics will require you have a laptop. Aside that, you just need access to a digital device, um, like for instance, the internet, as well as internet subscription and electricity obviously to power your device. Those are things you need. And also your commitments to see you the learning journey through. Um, okay, because someone like me, I'm interested in both UX, UX, UI, UX design, product design, and data analytics. I don't know which one I should go for, or which would be easier to learn. Catching DX, take oh geez, cats. Sorry, apologies. Do you want to give an advice? So let me phrase this question like this: Do you believe like? There are stereotypes that suit into um, or do you know of stereotypes and different local tech roles? For example, look at Mary now. For someone that is really picky or that you find yourself always nitpicking into the details, do you understand? You can say quality assurance might be a path that you want to tend to. If you are always picking into details and stuff like that, quality assurance might be a path that you want to tend to. Catherine, um, do you have like different career paths or stuff like that that you've observed? That maybe okay if you are, if you see yourself behaving like this, um, you should go here. If you see yourself behaving like this, you should try this out. Oh yeah, you so saw you're asking about this in respect to UX writing. In, in respect to local tech roles generally, just local tech roles generally, and yes, okay. obviously UX writing, any any role. Yeah, pretty, pretty. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's it's quite obvious, just as Mary has said. Anyone that is, of course, uh, I believe that working in tech or uh, whether no code or code general, you need to have an analytical mindset. But I do agree that uh, people in QA, like Mary, would be, they are already, they are trained because they have this, um, it's in it already, this ability to want to, you know, need to pick on very minute details uh, that. Uh, one or two persons would skip on. Um, in terms of UX writing, I think one of the obvious behavior is if you nerd over the words, if you find that you're always nerding over words, you see a copy on a billboard, for instance, or an advert copy, it doesn't have to be digital. You just find that you have this emotional response and curiosity behind. So you see a, a, a copy that moves you to act. Um, not everybody would be interested in finding out how that copy was written. Some persons would just move and some persons would just be like, oh, that's nice. There are some people that have this special interest and curiosity wanting to know how that wordings came about. It's very common for such people to fall into the writing career paths in tech. And I also find that designers have this innate um, interest in visuals, right? They just have this thing where they want something to have a very good visual appeal. I think uh, it's similar to what um, Ola saying they said in terms of the UI informing the UX, even though that's a very controversial take and I have my own reservations, but yeah, uh, it's sometimes two truths can exist. So yeah, you find that very good designers, it all started from wanting to have this very good visual appeal, um, their designs, their products, and you see that such a person just tends to go into your UX. Okay. 
yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kat. Uh, Mary, you want to add to that? Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, I want I wanted to answer this question um, using my own experience. So when I started out in tech, I wanted to be a developer. So I went on to learn Python like every other person. When you get, oh, Python is the next skill, do this. And I, I said, oh, okay, let me learn Python. But at the end of the day, Python actually did bite me at the very beginning. So I ran away. But when I mean run, I ran away, I necessarily did not run away. So I sat down and I did some research. So one thing you have to do is sit down and do a research on, okay, I want to go for UI designer design or UI UX design and data analysis. Which one do I tend to? So you do not want to jump into a career because everybody is doing it. You want to sit down and look at the roadmap, look at the ups and downs. So where you are going to Google, don't go and Google, where can this place, person work? Where can a UI UX design work? How much can they earn? You are not going to do that. You're going to have to sit down and say, okay, what's, what are the skills necessary? What are the pros and the cons? Then you talk with those people that are already in the industry or sign up for um, sections like this so that you actually listen. Um, when I ventured into quality assurance, because I signed up for a session like this. I actually sat down and I listened to it and I'm like, oh, um, I think this is the career that will suit me based on what I think. I like to give advice for UI. I will look at your UI. I know nothing about um, color codes. I don't know even how to combine to save, save my life, but at least I can find out what is wrong. I can give advice on, oh, why don't you do like this? I can improvise. So why not? Why don't I go for QA since this actually works with what I want? So you need to sit down and also, okay, I like UI design and I like data analysis. When you've finally selected the one you want, as we say in the industry, you need debt. When you have gotten the debt, then you can do what branch out, meaning you can venture into other industries, into other um, careers. You can say, okay, let me touch um, project management. Let me touch um, UI. Let me touch this. But first get a, a first select a particular career. After selecting that career, then you can decide to broaden. You can decide to branch out can decide to broaden your horizon instead of saying, oh, I want to use my two hands to grab both things at the same time. You might not get enough um, depth that is required. So for this person, sit down, take out a sheet of paper, write out your the, the research, do a research, do a proper research. Please don't go and look for how much money can I earn in one year. What is the average amount? Uh, and it's tech is not a get rich scheme. It is a career. And like every other career, you need to pay the price. So sit down, grab a pen, grab the notebook, and start doing your research. That's beautifully answered. Thank you so much, Mary, for that addition. You know, one thing she said I really like is go deep and go wide. First of all, go deep in one then you can go wide and spread your wings across your knees. Thank you very much for that. All right, um, we have that answered. And now, Shego, would you like to take us through this? Uh, what are the major challenges of being a product designer and a typical day in the life of a product designer? I don't know if you answered this question in the panel session, but uh, if you just breeze straight a bit. Oh, okay. Um, what are the major challenges of being a product designer? Hmm. Ooh. There are several challenges actually of being a product designer. Um, <clears throat> so let me say, um, challenges often arise, right, in product design when they are kind of like conflicting interests or different priorities, right? Um, for example, and this is just one of it, right? For example, uh, you might be working with the marketing team who want to prioritize flashy features, right, to attract customers. Why the why why the engineering team right want you to prioritize stability and scalability, 
right? How do you merge these two together? How do you kind of like find an alignment, right? Um, so this. So uh, one way that I found out how to deal with some of with this kind of challenge, right? Um, is through effective communication and um, you know you facilitating meetings to align priorities, right? Um, conducting enough research, right? To gather objective data because at the end of the day, you are not designing for it, for yourself. Okay, you are designing um, in order to achieve certain goals, right? And you need um, you need to prioritize ideas, right? That will help you to you know to achieve um, to achieve those goals. Um, challenges can also come in um, in ways like balancing user needs and business goals, right? Um, let me give an example. An example that I can give is um, I work in the fintech industry, in the financial service industry, right? And um, one critical um, thing that one critical challenge that we used to face is um, you know, whenever we are balancing user needs and business goals is in terms of KYC and compliance, right? Um, the business needs, according like as per regulations, right? You need to collect certain information from the users. But the truth is that if these informations, right, are collected at the onboarding, right, it can be extremely stressful for the for the users, right? So now this is a case of how do I satisfy my users, and at the end of the day, still meet up with business objective, right? And one of the ways that we, by which um, you know product designers by which we kind of like try to solve this. Is implementing um, the tier level, um, you know, um, um, you know, bringing um, the ideas of tier levels where, yeah, you can sign up immediately, um, but then for you to kind of like access um, certain features of the product, right? Then you need to submit certain um, requirements, basically. So by that way, you have been able to align both user needs, in other words, um, smooth onboarding, right? And the business objective too has been aligned. In other words, they are submitting their requirements in order to access um certain features right um another challenge that you might face might be managing stakeholders expectations right i mentioned this when you're collaborating with your team members um your marketing department engineering department your product managers right um, basically so like i said uh, you need to set priorities on um, you know what and what is most important right um another thing another challenge that you can face is um Probably staying creative and innovative, um, you know, having creative block, right? What do you do whenever you, um, you know, you sort of um, eat um, these roadblocks, right? I mean, you have deadlines, you have a lot of tasks, and there are deadlines, you know, approaching, and you are, you know, sort of having creative blocks, right? Um, how do you solve this, right? Um, one thing that I would say is try to sleep. I think it works for me. Right, whenever you are facing that, try to sleep, okay, and um, also don't um, don't neglect um, the impact that others can have on your work, right? Either your fellow designers or your team members, right? Try to collaborate a lot at that point, right? Bring in a lot of ideas that can help to you know, lift that would, um, that um, you know that creative block. And I think one final thing is you keeping up with technology trends. Um, like I've said before, technology is constantly evolving, right? How do you keep up with the changes, right? Um, you know, there's a need for you to learn new skills and whatnot. So those are kind of like the major challenges that you can face um, as a product designer and how you can, you know, try as much as possible to meander around um, those challenges. Um, All right. Okay. I think let's just say, do I need to take that second one? Uh, a typical day, maybe a just typical... run on screen. Just briefly, briefly, just okay. All right, all right. So a typical day uh, basically is just uh, meeting, work, meetings, work, meetings, work, attending stand ups, uh, you know, basically just to sync up on project status, um, discuss any blockers or challenges that you are facing. You want to update your team members on where you are at. Uh, pr pr probably you want to review priorities, right, for the day, um, you know, and then you spend time on your design tasks, on your actual design tasks. Then probably you need to document your design decisions and also have alignment meetings, right, with your team members. So your engineers and your managers ensure that you're meeting up with the requirements that has been set, um, you know, for the product that you're working on. So, yeah, that's pretty much like a summary of what you're doing to the activity.
All right, there was a question. Thank you very much. Um, please, when are we going to start the training? Our application closes April 15th. So once the application closes, there's going to be a week of reviewing and then we'll send the details across to everyone who has applied. Uh, for those who, who have successfully been granted access for, uh, or who have successfully qualified for the program, you'll be sent emails uh, of the necessary details, the next step to take um, after that. That's um, should get expecting an email around April, April 20th um, for that. So yes, um, application is still ongoing and is yet to close. So once the application is closed, you should be expecting an email a week after what's April 20th. All right, thank you very much, everyone. And we, today we come to the end of the panel session. I want to say thank you to our panelists and moderators. Um, just to wrap it up, we have about six minutes left. Just to wrap it up, could you just take one, 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 like go around. Also, you all are saying they just go around and just one tip for people who are starting in tech. Um, what's that one thing you did when you, you started? What's that one thing that you did that you think always works for? Whatever career path you're starting with and you're learning in tech, just just that one thing, just one thing. You did it, it worked for you. One thing you want to share and leave the, you just want to leave the out to it and drop it on there. So yes, anybody can start. Anyone wants to take it? Mm, I think I will go first. Okay, so thank you. The one thing I did that worked for me was that I actually volunteered a lot. I worked for free. Right, a lot. So while I was still doing my main job, I would come back in the evening when everybody is resting, while I've faced like a lot of Lagos traffic and all of those things. I would eat, have my beat, then sit like sit on my desk and you know, start my volunteer job. Sometimes I work till 12, 1, then I sleep. Then by 5 p.m. I'm up again, you know, to prepare for work. I did this for like about six months. Then I left that volunteer job for another volunteer job. So I can say I volunteered for almost a year, right? Then the next thing I saw was I got my first role through one of the persons I volunteered for, right? Give me like an opportunity. Then that was how, you know, everything started. So yeah, I volunteered literally. <laughs> yeah. And they say the rest is history, you know, and here we are now. So well done. Yeah. Today. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who would like to go next? Hi, for me, yeah. I would just say to focus on your strengths or what I call your zone of genius. So just focus on those things that come easy to you, that you enjoy. Uh, because at the end of the day, whether you're working in tech or wherever you're working, you want to find joy and fulfillment in what you're doing it's there are, there's going to be very difficult days and there's going to be days where you may not make a lot of money uh but you will really need um something to keep your head in the game so it's very important to start with your strengths uh whether tech or no tech just focus on your strengths and then try to augment with new things as you go so yeah thank you very much for that cat um uh, mary do you want to take this well you said one thing so one thing i'll be i would say have a learner's mindset i think everyone has been emphasizing on the learner's mindset and i would say that is very important you have to have a learner's mindset. That means being ready to learn because transitioning or starting a new tech role, it's not, it's not easy. So that days that you need to um, go online, reach out to people. I still do that. I still reach out to people I feel in your colleagues to ask for questions, to ask questions when I'm stuck. I still say, oh, oh I'm stuck here. And also I... When I say learner's mindset, so you might think that something should go this way. Then when you discuss with others, you see like, oh, I missed it somewhere. This is how it's supposed to go. And with that thing, they'll say experience is something you build where you 
work when you learn when you get your hands dirty so learner's mindset helps you to broaden your horizon so you are ready to learn you are ready to work you're you're just you just want to do in your best and because when you your eyes is focused on something you every noise you you don't get distracted easily so you and the noises in your background are silent why i keep saying this is because a lot of people transition into tech because they feel it's the new oil money. And if you feel it's the new oil money and you refuse to work and you refuse to do pay the sacrifice, just like a volunteer, just as she said, get in your zone of genius, all these things will just be wasted and you will move on to another career and keep jumping like that. But when you get in and say, okay, this is the goal, I'm ready to learn, I'm learning to put in the sacrifice, put in the effort. I'm going to tell you that when you look back, maybe one year or six months or two years down the line, you'll be like, oh, I've come this far. I can't believe it. Just because you're ready to put in the effort, the time, you're ready to learn. And in learning, you must unlearn some things. You must um, see new things with your eyes because trends are going to come up. The things you know before might not be relevant anymore. So you need to keep upgrading and upskilling. As one of my madam will say, you need to keep upskilling every day by day. So that's my own tip. All right. Thank you very much, Mary. And the last but not least, Olu Shebu as a round of the course. Right. Um, I think um, we are um, <clears throat> just starting out, um, honestly. Um, and this worked for me, right? Also, the capacity, right? Um, sharpen that skill first. Um, it, this this might be controversial, right? But don't think about money at first, at, at least for the first few months, right? Um, that's if you are new into the industry, right? Don't, don't think about money first. First of all, think about building that capacity. It's when you build that capacity, then you can monetize the value, right? So, first of all, build that capacity. Um, volunteer, just like what I said, they said, um, don't be scared to do free work. Right, the point is for you to you know get yourself out there and show people what you can do, basically. And I mean, you are, you are going to see like um, the value basically um, after doing all this. So yeah, build capacity first. Basically. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Good. Uh, this has been a wonderful session with all our panelists and moderator. But today, I see a lot of questions are coming. I try to answer as many as I can. Um, with this, we come to the end of the panel session today. I want to say thank you to Catherine, um, Olushego, or the last day, and Mary for the time spent on the call today. Hi, guys. Please let us just say a big thank you to them in the chat box uh, as we round up the session today. Thank you very much. Actually, enjoyed everything you shared with us. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be coming to all your DMs. There's still more. The whole program still extends for weeks and. You know, we're just getting started. This is the first phase. And yes, you know, our video deals for more conversations in the program. But yes, that's all for now. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, you can call it a wrap. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.